breakfast. Uh, so I'll, I'll share it with you before we get started. While you're take, finding your place, uh, we'll, we'll let you do that, and then I'll tell you that little humorous story. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter 1, there was a, a, this, this preacher that, that had this habit of, of putting a mint in his mouth, and that's kind of the way he judged how long to preach. He'd put that mint in his mouth, and he'd preach till it was gone, and then he'd be done. And that worked fairly well for him until one day he, boy, he just preached and preached and preached, couldn't figure out what was going on. Then he realized he reached in there and he pulled out a button and put it in his mouth. And that, he just he was sucking on that button for a long time. <laughs> anyway, it's not a button, I promise. I promise we're not going to, we're not going to do that. But amen. Amen. <clears throat> I do want to, to, I forgot one, one praise report that I wanted to give you. Uh, Miss Holly. Uh, Miss Emma sent me a message this week about Miss Holly. They did have the surgery. They did find out what was wrong, what was causing the problem, uh, and they will be fixing that. Now they know exactly what to do. So thank you for praying for her. We had special prayer Wednesday night. And I just wanted to pass along to the church that praise report uh, that, that things are looking up, things are looking better for her. So you, you thank you for praying. Amen. It's always a good thing uh, to pray. Amen. It goes along with our song. Uh, and then by faith, trusting and seeing what God will do, and then reporting on what He has done and rejoicing in that. All right, Matthew chapter number 1, we're going to look at a little bit of background. I, I promise the message will not be long. Now, the introduction might take a while, uh, but the message will be short. I promise. Uh, that's the third part of the, uh, of the message will actually be the message this morning. Uh, but we got two big porches to get to before we get there. All right. So just bear with me. It'll be all right. It's always good to be reminded of some things that we know. It's always good to be uh, reminded about how God has taken some things and encouraged us in the past uh, and, and some things that we have knowledge of, but maybe we're not acting upon like we should or not thinking about that in the forefront of our minds. We've kind of kind of put it, we talked about creation in our Sunday school class this morning. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, you know, creation, that's for, for the for the little kids Sunday school classes and but you know, there is so much in that story of creation, if we'll read it slowly and we'll read it carefully, it'll just jump off the page at us at God setting in motion the order that we still live under today. Well now, preacher, come on, you, you, you don't mean to tell me that, that you think that in, in Genesis chapter 1, God set forth some things uh, that, well, you know, the Bible does talk about Everything producing after its own kind. That's in Genesis chapter 1. We're still doing that. The Bible, I don't care what everybody else says in the world. The Bible still talks about it in Genesis chapter 1 that God created man. He created them male and female. Created He them. Now they can make up however many genders they want, but there's still two in the Bible. Yeah, I, I, I do stand on that fact that Everything we look at in Genesis, we stand there. It, it, it starts the foundation of everything that we believe. There's your Sunday, there's your Sunday school advertisement. You missed Sunday school this morning. You ought, you ought to come. You ought to be there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have a good time. I know there's some other classes that, that are dealing with creation right now. Uh, they got it from me. They stole it from me. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I'm picking at Brother Jim. He did not do that. that just, it just happened that way. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, let's stand. Matthew chapter number 1. Uh, we'll read a few verses of Scripture this morning. Yes, we are going to deal, be dealing with the birth of Christ. Yes, we're going to be dealing with the Christmas story. Uh, but I think this is a good time to go back and look at that a little bit uh, and, and be rehearsed uh, and to be encouraged by what God says uh, about the Christmas story. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 18. Look at this. We'll start reading there. It says... Now the birth of Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That's twice now we've seen in this passage, we, we've heard and, and read that the, this child was of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, 
And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord had bidden him, took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the reading of your word this morning. I pray that you'll help us as we study, that you'll remind us of some things we know, that you'll stamp in our hearts the truths that you have to reveal to us, and that you'll help us to practice and live as we believe what you've said. Pray that you'll be with those under my voice that, that need to, a touch this morning, whether it be healing, whether it be spiritually, maybe there's one maybe that may need salvation this morning. I pray that you will, through the blessings of the Christmas story, draw them to the saving knowledge of Christ. We love you. Thank you for your goodness, your grace toward us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As we look through this story, and again, as I read, there, there are so many things that to me, and, and I don't know if this is the way it happens for you when you read the Scriptures or not, but I start reading through the Bible and, and, and things just start jumping off of the page at me. And I, I've, sometimes, now this is going to sound funny, but sometimes i got to back up and say, wait a minute, I, I don't want to get distracted on that. I, I'm looking at something else right now. I've got to stick to Got to stick to the program here, uh, or I'll chase rabbits all day. So y'all don't y'all don't understand the struggles that go that, that happen uh, from the time I start preaching to the time I end. You know, it's not so much what is said; it's it's those things that I don't say that run through here that I'm trying to filter. You know, we want to stick with the with what God has for us this morning. As we look through and read through this this uh, story of the birth of Christ. Again, there are so many things that, that just jump out, but I want to start in verse number 22 because I want to kind of do a little bit of a, kind of a chronological thing, but, uh, but I, I, we need to back up and, and look at this. Look at verse 22. The Bible says this, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, or spoken of the Lord by the prophets. Now he's going to give us specifically in verse 23 a single prophecy that was given specifically about what he's talking about here. But I did a little research, and, and I found out that there are over 350 prophecies concerning the birth of Christ. Over 350. And I'm not a math whiz. I mean, I had to look all this up on the Internet and try to figure out how to do it. Uh, but you can find all that if you'll look it up. And years ago, I looked that up it, th for one man. Now, I'm going to use a word in church that y'all probably not have not heard in church very often. What are the odds, there's your word, what are the odds for one man to fulfill 350 prophecies concerning the birth of Christ? I understand Jesus fulfilled every one of them. What are the mathematical odds for one man to fulfill 350 prophecies? I did some calculations. I looked it up on how to calculate that. I did some calculations and figured it up. And the best way, I used to have a banner that I could show you. That made most sense. But I'll try to do it this way. That banner literally would stretch almost from wall to wall in this sanctuary. It was a one with 36 zeros behind it. That's the mathematical odds of one man fulfilling 350 prophecies about the coming of Christ. Y'all don't seem impressed. Uh, maybe I need to make the banner so you can see it. That, that is amazing. That my God, He is big enough, number one, to give 350 prophecies about how the Messiah was going to come and then to send His Son and fulfill every one of those prophecies to the letter that we might know that this is the Son of God, it is the prophesied one, it is He that God said who would come, and He is here to take away the sin of the world. That is my God. I'm excited about the prophecies. We don't have time to go over 350. We don't. But what I'd like to do is share with you just a couple. 
And as we do that, just be reminded of that banner. And that, the, the first time I preached that, I pulled that banner out and I had them stand in the front of the foyer, of the, in the front of the church, and I had them stand there while I was preaching about the prophecies uh, of Christ. And every time we talk about fulfilling a prophecy, I'd point to that banner and say, One of these. One of these. So if I do that, just in your mind, understand what I'm talking about. All right. So we need to understand uh, that, that the prophecies of the birth of Christ give us an understanding of who He is that came and who He is that sent and, and the graciousness of a great, holy, mighty God that would send His Son for me. Because that's why He did it. Now, I'm going like, to let you get involved, but He did it for me. Oh, no, He did it. Somebody got that. Thank you. No, He did it for all of us. Sometimes I like to just think, oh, Lord, if I'd have been the only one, He'd have, done, he'd have come just for me. Because that's the truth. If you'd have been the only one, He'd have come just for you. So let's talk about that just for a moment, about the prophecies of the birth of Christ. Number one, we'll see in our text the, the prophecy of the type of birth. You realize that no one has ever been born like Him. Now wait a minute, Mary carried that baby for nine months. She went into labor just like everybody else did. She gave birth just like women have done for thousands of years. She, it, it, okay, but you're missing the point. The point is not that she carried the baby. The point is not that she gave birth to the baby. The point is, is how the baby got there to start with. There's been no other birth like the birth of Christ. He tells us in verse 23 of our text, we've already read it, we'll read it again. It says this, Behold, now if you don't have a King James Bible, you're in trouble right here. It says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Now that is a direct quotation from Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. That is a direct, let me read it for you. Okay, some of you. Y'all got to work with me here. Come on now. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. So we find the type of His birth is very special. It's never happened like that before. It'll never happen like that again. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, the, the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed her. We brought that out as we read through the text this morning uh, that it was of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost brought about that pregnancy and Jesus Christ, the virgin-born Son of God, came into this world. The type of birth is a birth like we've never seen before or since. That's my God. That's my God. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be uh, uh, astounded by that. That's my God. That's what He does. Uh, we, were, we were watching a little... Well, I, I can't, I'm, I, I'm almost ashamed to tell you this. We were, <laughs> we were watching a little cartoon yesterday. There's not any kids in my house anymore. I don't know why we were doing this. But we were watching one of them little Christmas specials yesterday. And, and I don't know if you saw it, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but there was a song. There was a song in there that, 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 and the title of the song is Sometimes Even a Miracle Needs a Hand. And I turned to my wife and I said, well, yeah, that's why it's called a miracle. What? <laughs> a miracle needs a hand? No, if it needs a hand, it's not a miracle. I mean, come on, people. See, we, we need to understand, God showed up and God did something that we can't do. Oh, preacher, you don't understand that now in the laboratory they can do... No, listen, I'm talking about a natural uh, 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 process, uh, not something that we've devised or something that we've twisted. I'm talking about God overshadowing Mary and her becoming uh, with the child by the Holy Ghost and giving birth to this virgin-born Son of God. Preacher, why are you so hung up on the fact of the virgin birth? I'm hung up on the fact of the virgin birth because if we don't have a virgin birth, we don't have a Savior. If we don't have a virgin birth, then Jesus Christ would have inherited a sin nature and He did not. The Bible says that He who knew no sin became sin for you and I. He chose sin. When He cried out, I thirst on the cross, He received that cup. 
God had talked about in the garden. He became sin for you and I. The type of His birth was very special. The Bible also talks about this. Not only talk about the type of His birth, but it talks about the time. The time of His birth. Take your Bible, go to Galatians. Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. And we'll start ta- reading about this. Time, the time of His birth. You realize that Jesus Christ was born not by accident. Couldn't have been by accident. The Holy Spirit of God had to overshadow Mary. The timing of His birth was not inconsequential. He came exactly when God determined He should come. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4 says that, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law. There was a specific moment when God had purposed for His Son to be born. Take your Bible, look in Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9. We'll look at verse number 25. Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 25, talking about the prophecies. Now this is hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 25. Notice what it says here. I'm waiting for pages to to turn. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. I marked mine, so it was, that's why I'm waiting. All right. Knowing therefore and understand that from the beginning forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. And threescore and two weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. We find in, chap- in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 9, a statement in the prophecy of the the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we find in that prophecy, God gives a timetable for the birth of Christ. He says, when you see this, you can count the days until the birth of Messiah. He said, let's read it again, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Now, historians tell us that there was a certain date uh, back when uh, Nehemiah was given the the, uh, commandment to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem. And and you can count that 70th, that that, that time frame that they put forth here, uh, and and you can carry it forward all the way to the arrest and trial of Christ, and it almost comes out to the day of the time frame that he gives here in verse 25. Listen, if he can tell us the type of birth he's going to have, he can tell us the time of birth that he's going to have. I got a better, I got another one for you. And we could do this 350 times. We don't have time for that this morning. But let me give you one more. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Micah. It's there in the Old Testament. There in the prophets. If you're there in Daniel, and you'll just start turning right a little bit, uh, you'll find the book of Micah. Uh, it's around there. If you run across Jonah, uh, then it's Micah, uh, then it's Habakkuk. And then if you find any of those three, uh, you'll, you, that, that'll get you close. Uh, so just look in the book of Micah, if you will. I'll give you a chance. Just turn right a little bit. Find that one. We're going to be in chapter number 5, and we'll look at a verse there. Now, I'm trying to... This prophecy thing got to be easy on. I know I had to... I was sitting in my office. The reason I marked them because it would look kind of funny for the preacher up here not be able to find it. <laughs> Just smile right there. It'll be okay. All right. Micah chapter number 5. Now listen to this. We're talking about the prophecies of the birth of Christ. We've talked about the time of His birth. He told us when it was going to be. We've talked about the type of His birth. He told us what that would be. Now He's going to tell us in Micah chapter number 5 in verse number 2, He's going to ta- tell us the town of His birth. You realize, before we read it, you realize there are 400 years at least between this and the birth of Christ. There's 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
So at least 400 years, and then you start backtracking from there to get to the book of Micah. I'm going to make it easy on us. I'm going to say at least 400 years prior to the birth of Christ, God's going to tell us what town you can go to. How did the wise men know where to go? They knew the prophecy. Oh, they followed the star. How did they know to follow the star? They knew the prophecies. Micah, chapter number 5. Micah, chapter number 5, verse number 2. Look at this. But thou, Bethlehem of though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old and, and, ever, and everlasting. Over 400 years will pass. But God says, that little town right over there, Bethlehem, that's where he's coming from. He's coming from Bethlehem. Now hang on, let's just preach here. We're going to pause right here and preach a little bit. You mean to tell me that the God who could say, my son's going to be virgin born, and it happened. That my son's going to be born at a certain time, and it happened to the day that he said it would. And the God that said over 400 years before that my son's going to be born in that town, that God, you mean to tell me that God can't take care of us? You mean to tell me we worry and fret and get all worked up over things that, that, we are, that are out of our control and we can't do anything about? Listen, we've got a God in heaven. If we know Christ is our Savior, we've got a God in heaven that can deal with our difficulties because He knows everything from the beginning to the end and He orchestrates everything and He puts it all together and when He says something's going to happen, it takes place. I'm glad I've got a God who could prophesy the birth of His Son and it take place just like He said. Number two. Not only was it a prophesied birth, we find that it was a very peculiar birth. We've talked about this a little bit already in the prophecy, so we'll not spend a whole lot of time. I told you I was building a porch. I'm getting there. Verse number 18 of our text. Go back. Matthew chapter 1. Verse number 18. The Bible says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together. Now there's an interesting phrase, right? Amen. Before they came together. You can find it again. <laughs> it's in here somewhere. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. See, it was a very peculiar birth. It was peculiar in conception. She was conceived, Christ was conceived of the Holy Ghost. It was, it was peculiar in its circumstances. The angel of God came to Mary and said, Thou art highly favored. He, he didn't say thou were, that all these other things the Catholic Church want to give to her. He said, Thou art highly favored among women. Uh, and, and we find later that she needed a Savior just like anybody else. But uh, we go through and find that the, the angel of God came to her and told her what was going on. And she didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and then Joseph, when he found out she was with child, he wanted to do the right thing. And he was very kind-hearted and gentle. And he didn't want to make a public example of her. And he was trying to figure out what to do with her. When the angel of God came to him and told him what was going on. It was a very peculiar birth. But I'm glad my God does some peculiar things. I'm glad my God does things that the world don't understand. I'm glad that my God does things. We're talking, hey listen, Brother Mike, I don't know how I'm fixing to get this in here. We've been talking about budgets. Budgets. How in the world are we going to get God in a budget? See, God works in ways... I, I love the... He's not, he's not, I can talk now. He's not in here. I can say all this. Amen. He's back there with the young people. We were talking the other night. We were talking about budgets. And first statement he made. Now, before you judge him, you just hang on. Now, this is a good example. He said, you know, I said, I preach, I want to make this comment right up front before we talk about this budget. He said, you know, uh, in the business world, if you don't have money, you don't budget for it. I mean, you, if it ain't there, you don't make a budget. That's just the way it is. You don't spend money you don't have. I said, I agree with that, sir. And then he followed up with this statement. He said, but this ain't a business. Amen. It's a church. And we walk by faith. Amen, Brother Jerry. Faith is the key that opens that door. 
Now, I understand there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. I've got faith, but I ain't going to go walk down the middle of the highway thinking, yo, God's going to take care of me. God's going to say, dummy, you ought to have no sense not to walk down the middle of the highway. There's a fine line between faith and foolishness. But I believe with all my heart that we've got to walk by faith. And I believe with all my heart that God has demonstrated Himself over and over and over and over again to show us that we can walk by faith and we can experience what He wants us to experience and the world will not understand it and the world will think we're crazy and the world will think we've lost our mind because we're not using common sense. No, I want to use God's sense. I'm glad I've got a God that said, hey, let me show you something peculiar. Let me show you something that just don't happen every day. I'm glad we can come together. Listen, I'm glad we struggle sometimes. I'm glad we have difficulties at times. Because when we come and we, and we have a, a time when God really shows up in our life and shows out and does something peculiar causes us to rejoice even the more. Oh, we know He's there and we feel His presence and we experience His love and His joy through the difficulty. But when He shows up and He, he overcomes and He brings us through and we, we survive and we make it to the other side and we see that peculiar hand of God in our lives, we just rejoice in the fact that God's still alive and God's still doing things and God's still on the throne and we rejoice in what God's doing. I think as God prophesied the birth of Christ and God gave that peculiar birth, He was just waving that flag to mankind and saying, Hey guys, look over here. Hey guys, look. Hey, listen, let me, let, me, let me chase a rabbit real quick. Check clock. Why did God call a nation? Why did God raise up the nation of Israel? Because He liked those people? Well, not particularly. There was a lot of stuff that happened. Why did He raise up the nation of Israel? He rose, he pulled up the nation of Israel and set them. You read the Old Testament. He set them up, and here's what he did. He said, Now look, I'm going to show the nations around you what God will do for a people that will trust and follow God. Israel was God's showpiece in the Old Testament to demonstrate Himself to everybody else around them that when they prayed and sought God and followed God and were obedient to God, even the giants, Goliath, couldn't stand before them. Even the Philistines couldn't stand before them. Even any army that came against them. You'll read the Old Testament. You'll find victory after victory after victory. Why? Because God demonstrated Himself great in their midst. You got some of you agree with that one. So you may not agree with this one. Here, now let's go forward. Let's get into the New Testament age. Why? Why did God raise up a church? Why did God in the New Testament start a local New Testament church and raise that church up? Why did He do that? For the same reason He picked a nation in the Old Testament. He pulled out a church and He rose them up and He did put them up there so they could be a showpiece to the world of what a people who followed God and trusted God and prayed to God and sought God and obeyed God that God would show Himself faithful and great in the midst of that people. See, here's the difficulty. Why is it so hard today to get people to come to church? Why is it so hard to get people to be faithful and be involved. Because we're not seeing God demonstrated. We're not seeing God working like He used to. We're not seeing in churches. Listen, I've talked to the old timers that talked about meetings uh, that you know started. You're hard, it's hard to find a full week revival anymore. I've talked to the old timers that said they'd start preaching and they'd just preach for week after week after week. As God was moving, they'd keep preaching. You start talking about having three or four nights in a row and people start saying, oh, I can't handle that preacher. And we wonder why God's not moving like He used to. We wonder why the church is anemic like it is today. We wonder why people look at the church and say, well, you know, it's just, a, it's, I'll go if I want to. If I don't have anything else to do. And we wonder why God's not moving. What happened to Israel? 
Now, see, that was kind of a trick question, a, a, a quick, uh, a, a trick uh, a path that I took you on. What happened to Israel when they stopped listening to God? Y'all know the answer to that question. Y'all just don't want to say it. They went into captivity. They fell as a nation. Why? They, was, they were not following God. They lost their influence. That reminds me of just an old statement. See, y'all done got quiet on me. Reminds me of that old statement. If you don't know history, you're bound to repeat it. Too many folks, too many folks have not read the Old Testament. They don't know their Old Testament history. And the church is repeating it. Amen or old me right there. It's okay. I got a Bible. I'm all right. So let's get to the message. Since you're, since you're wound up now, let's get to the message. Verse 21 of our text. We talked about this. It was a prophesied birth. I'm glad I've got a God that's big enough to tell us all that was going to take place. We talked about a peculiar birth. I'm glad I've got a God that's big enough to do it just like He said He would. Look at verse 21. It was a purposeful birth. There was purpose all bound up in what Jesus did. Verse 21 of our text. She shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Not much room for doubt there, is it? God spoke to Joseph and he said, boy, let me tell you something. Don't, don't get all excited. Don't get all worked up. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Number one, you're going to have a son. Yeah, just like you said. Number two, his name's going to be Jesus. Or he, he said you'll call his name. His name was already Jesus. Just smile right there. It'll be okay. And he shall save his people from their sins. All right, real quick, let me give you the message. Number one, the birth of Christ was to manifest God. See, there's a lot of folks today, they don't mind you talking about a baby in a manger. They don't mind you talking about the, the, the manger scene. They don't mind you talking about the wise men and the shepherds and the angels and all that nice little Christmas story. But what they want to do is they want to leave Him in that manger. They want to see. Here, here's what here's what happens. Now, hang on, just smile. It'll be okay. Nobody knows what you just didn't get. They want to take that manger scene. They want to put it back in the box, and they want to put it back in the closet till next till, till next Christmas. And then next Christmas, they'll get that box back out. Oh, it's time to think about God again. And they'll put that manger scene back out, and they'll look at that little baby in the manger, and they go, "Oh, ain't that nice?" And they don't think of. Listen, he didn't stay in that manger. The Bible says that he grew. The Bible said that he grew into adulthood, that he grew into manhood, that for three and a half years he, he preached and he, he brought forth that ministry that God sent him uh, to, to, to proclaim. And then he went to that cross and, and received the sin of mankind and died for our sin. We need to realize the birth of Christ proclaims a purpose and we've got to share that purpose with others. Take your Bible. Go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll look at verse number 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, talking about this idea of the purpose. Why? Why are we celebrating Christmas? Why do we make it such a big deal? Because we get to proclaim the birth of the Savior. We get to proclaim the manifestation of God. We get to proclaim that this is the one that God said would come. We get to proclaim that this is Messiah. We get to proclaim that we have hope in Christ. Why? Because He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on Calvary's cross. He rose again the third day and He's seated at the right hand of the Father today making intercession for us. We have a God that's still alive. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, 
seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. We have a God that's sitting on the throne of God today. The purpose of the birth was to manifest God to mankind. Number two, it was to manifest the triumph of God. The triumph. Now wait a minute, preacher. Now I've read a little bit of the Bible. Now I've read some of the New Testament. Now I know that this life of Jesus wasn't all roses and peaches and cream. Well, who said it? Ever, who said it's got to be roses and peaches and cream for it to be for it to be purposeful? See, again, we bought into the lie of the devil that says if everything ain't great, then you must be doing something wrong. I wish you'd, I wish you'd read a little bit more of the Bible. Amen. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Just turn over to the right a little bit. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 8. Matter of fact, this is one of the verses that we looked at on Wednesday nights. So, you know, if you missed that, you, you ought to come on Wednesday night. You know, it all ties together eventually. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 8, the Bible says this, he that, committed, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. You remember, remember back in Genesis chapter 3? There's a verse of Scripture over there that's, that's one of the first prophetical verses in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, let's just turn over and read it. All right, let's, let's do that. we got time. We ain't in a hurry. Genesis, I didn't hear any snickers on that one. All right, Genesis chapter 3. But I want you to see this. I want you to tie all this together. Because it all fits. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is the first prophecy of Messiah to come. And he tells the old devil here uh, in Genesis chapter 3, he said, now you may bruise his heel, you may cause some problems along the way. You may cause some difficulties, but there's going to come a day, son, that He is going to bruise thy head. There's going to come a day when He is going to demonstrate and prove and show His authority over you once and for all. When did that happen? Well, that happened. Well, let me just tell you this story and tell you how it happened. Through the process of time, or as Genesis 4, 4 said, in the fullness of the time, Jesus Christ was born. At the time of the birth of Christ, all of hell came against Him to try to destroy Him. Because the devil knew who He was. The devil knew who He was. That's why we have the life of Christ that we do. That's why we have the temptations uh, that are written about in the Gospels. He knew who He was. And that day... As the skies drew dark, the angels of God turned their head. And the Son of God Himself bowed His head on that cross and said, It is finished and gave up the ghost. While there was weeping in heaven, there was rejoicing in the pits of hell. There was rejoicing by the demonic forces the devil had thought he had won. He thought he had overcome the Son of God. And I wonder, for three days and for three nights, if they didn't have a party like you ain't ever seen. There's a song, Brother Jerry, that I, I've heard years ago that talked about that conversation between the old devil and, and that demon posted outside the grave. First day, oh, he's still here. Second day, don't worry about it, I got him, he's still here. Third day, come on now. Third day, report, ah, no, I don't want to say anything. 
Third day, what, what's going on? No, he's not here. He's risen. He's alive. We need to understand uh, that, that the triumph of God is this. Jesus Christ came and He overcame death, hell, and the grave. And He was given the keys. And He is God forevermore. He never ceased to be God. But He made Himself a little lower than the angels that He might identify with us and take our sin and become our Savior. Last verse, I promise. First John. If you're still in First John, just turn, turn, left, uh, turn right a little bit. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 9. Look at this. Let's read it. And this was manifest, manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. What greater love? Does the Bible not say this? A greater love hath, hath no man than this. We lay down His life. First friend, you realize, you realize, I don't know if I can tell this story. <laughs> when I first started carrying a firearm in Mississippi, I went to the security team at our church. And I was talking with the head of our security team. And I made this statement. I said, the reason I carry a firearm is this. And, and this morning, there's one sitting in this room that I have no doubt. I would have no hesitation to use a firearm to defend that girl sitting right there. Normally, I'd say I'd do it for two, in that, but my wife is not here this morning. I have no problem defending my daughter. I would l gladly lay down my life for her. And I said to him, and I'll say to you, I believe with all my heart that it would not be difficult for me to lay down my life for one of you. Because you are my friend. And I love you. And that kind of makes sense to us. But you realize that God laid down His life for us when we didn't even care about Him? You realize that we, when we could have spit in the face of God, He still died for us? We talk about the birth of Christ. Talk about the prophecies, we talk about the peculiarness. It all comes down to this. It's to manifest the love of God. The only reason we love Him, the Bible says, is because He first loved us. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 that God commended His love toward us, and yet while we and, and that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. See, as you look at that baby in that manger this Christmas season, don't see a baby. Don't see just a figure of an infant child. Realize who that is. Who that represents. That represents God who loved you enough to leave glory and die for our sin. Just a few weeks, we are going to be exchanging presents with family. We're going to be having a great time. But listen to me. How sad would it be for you to enjoy all of the activities of life and miss the greatest gift that has been ever offered to you. That gift is salvation through Christ who loved you enough to die for you. Head bowed and eyes are closed.